to the Chief Economist at the Environmental Defence Fund uh, Fireside Chat. Um, we're going to get started um, because we have a fairly short amount of time here. Just wanted to start with a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first, can you please note that this session is being recorded and will be made available to the public. Um, we're going to have Thomas Stoner presenting for about 20 minutes. And then after that, uh, Nat Cohane and I will ask a few uh, questions as moderators. And then we will open up to questions from, uh, from you. At any point, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to put in a question. Um, and we will we'll respond to those uh, live um, or, or if we run out of time um, after the session. So with no further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Thomas Stirner, which is a great pleasure. He's a professor of environmental economics at the University of Gothenburg. Uh, he was the chief economist at the Environmental Defence Fund from 2012 uh, to 2013. His work is very much focused on the design of policy instruments with a particular emphasis in the economics of energy use and climate change. And with his team in Sweden, he established economics for development, which is an amazing initiative. It's an institute, uh, it's, a, it's a network of research centers that now uh, is present in 13 developing countries across the world, bringing environmental economics uh, to do both research and also policy outreach in those countries. And I've known uh, Thomas for 25 years or so, and to me, he's really noticeable as one of the first environmental economists who really focused on issues of equity. So in that way, he was well ahead of his time and we're very lucky to have him. So I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Thomas. Thanks, Susie. That's a very nice introduction. Um, and this is, for me, a somewhat unusual paper and somewhat unusual subject. I usually, as Susie was saying, I usually uh, do my research and my talking on policy instrument design. Uh, so uh, this is different. This paper is about the goal itself. Normally I take the goal as a given and uh, focus on what I think is the most practical and usually the most important topic, which is, you know, which instrument, uh, how are we going to fine tune the instrument, which instrument, when do we want to use a tradable permit, when do we want to use a tax, when do we want to use subsidy or regulation or something else. But I'm not going to really talk about that today. I'm going to talk about the, the goal itself of, of climate change. And um, the reason for that is that it goes back to October the 8th, 2018, just to choose a particular day. Um, on that day in the morning, the IPCC special report uh, on 1.5 degrees came out. And um, I was, at the time, uh, in the, the whole period of preparation of the 1.5 degree report, I was preoccupied and worried. And I was wondering, you know, is, is it really realistic to talk about 1.5? I mean, how, isn't it too late? Is, uh, you know, we're, um, we already have so much warming, you know, uh, it's gonna be difficult. But the IPCC, um, came out showing that that the 1.5 degrees was was possible or close to 1.5 was was possible and desirable that the that the the costs of not doing it would be higher than the cost of doing it overall in the afternoon the same day the uh, the prize committee of the swedish um, well it has a long title it's usually called the Nobel Prize in Economics, although in Sweden it's not, because technically it's not part of the Nobel Prize, but it's, it's generally thought of as the Nobel Prize in Economics. Um, uh, this was announced and it was given uh, to two people, one of them being Bill Nordhaus. Um, and I was on television that evening commenting and saying that, you know, that Bill Nordhaus was a, was a fine researcher and a good choice. And, uh, and so on, but I also got pushed a little bit into into you know if there weren't any any criticisms, and I said, well, it's you know it's it's a strange day because in the morning we had the IPCC coming out 
sort of in favor of 1.5 degrees instead of two. And here we have a Nobel Prize to someone who actually says that the um, optimum amount of warming, the goal, should be four degrees centigrade. Uh, it's often called 3.5, but if you look at Bill Nordhaus's optimal trajectories, they reach 3.5 degrees by 2100, and actually four degrees by about 2150. And as I said earlier, I don't normally deal with the goals so much. I deal more with intricacies of policy instruments. But this is such a striking, such a dramatic um, disparity in the goals that, that of course, it, it catches your attention. And I have, have worked earlier with Dice and, and, and Nordhaus's um, uh, policy conclusions. And so, uh, together with a, a group of researchers, uh, we set about uh, looking at this in greater detail. The IPCC has long said that, uh, that if we have um, three or four degrees of, of warming, we have dramatic risks to very many uh, ecosystems and ecosystem services on which humanity depends. It is a little bit hard to understand how reaching 3.5 or 4 degrees can be optimal. But um, before we, I mean, the paper is about disagreement with the North House. I would also like to say, though, that first of all, I do respect and, and discuss these things with him. And, uh, the other thing I'd like to say is that we're in agreement about many things. One of these is that the carbon price is the best instrument. Um, we're in agreement that it would be uh, probably necessary for some group of countries to go ahead in what Bill Nordhaus has pioneered as, as climate clubs. We agree that it's great to use DICE to discuss these things. And in a way, we agree about the the conclusion, at least compared to the rest of the world, the rest of the world actually has price of zero, except in one or two small places like Sweden. Um, and Nordhaus recommends raising this to $50, and we say it should be raised to a bit more, maybe 150 or something instead. Um, so that's the sort of the overall framework. Now let's get into the details. Uh, this is a complicated paper and it builds on half a dozen other papers. So it's almost impossible to present, but I'll try uh, my best. Uh, it will have to be a little bit, um, you know, in an in a overview mode, of course. So one of the things we changed, the first thing that I, and that I will talk about today is the damage function. The damage function is something we know very little about. And it's most important uh, thing there is, um, uh, and so it's it's difficult. But uh, Peter Howard and I uh, wrote the paper about this a, a, a couple of years ago that we published in the ERE, and we will be basing our work in in this paper on on that on that damage function. Um, we also do updates that are pure uh, climate science and they concern the carbon cycle, the energy balance models that underlie um, DICE. And in, in these parts, um, I would say that we are, in some sense, updating the work that the Nordhaus has done. We think here uh, that we just have a better, uh, more up-to-date science. Um, when uh, it comes to some of the other things, like the non-carbon gases, uh, the availability of negative emission technologies, and the ethical parameters of discounting, some of these things are modeling choices. We, of course, choose what we think are the most appropriate and reasonable um, choices, 
But when it comes to um, discounting, for instance, it's an essentially ethical choice. We can't say that we are right, somebody else is wrong. We can, we still argue for the position we take. But um, when it comes to the carbon cycle and the energy balance, we actually think that we are right and that uh, there's good reason to, to make these changes. So let's, let's dive into each of these in turn. Mm. This, this diagram just summarizes the, um, uh, the DICE model, which integrates climate and economy and, and some of the changes we make. Oops, sorry, I, the sharing stopped and I'm sorry about that. I'll, uh, I don't know what happened there. Yes, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen. But, uh, okay, we're back. So here is, um, I hope this is working now and, and you see the damage function on my screen. So, um, um, we're building on a paper that I wrote with Peter Howard, uh, published in ERE. And um, <clears throat> to, there are some somewhere between 20 and 40, 50 earlier studies of, uh, of the damage function. And basically, there's a history here, which is quite important, because the first time uh, uh, Nordhaus used and, and launched the DICE model, he needed a damage function. And he basically did a sort of a back of the envelope uh, damage function himself and, and put it into DICE. And that was the first damage function. It's quite reasonable to do a back of the envelope and, and put this in. And some five years later, he did an update and he, he sort of looked and, and he saw that, you know, what what, what's the literature here? And there was his own first study, and then there were a couple of other studies by, by Toll, for instance. And so he sort of summarized these, and this became a new study. And in some sense, simplifying a lot, this has gone on, and particularly uh, Toll and a few other people uh, and Nordhaus have done repeated studies, uh, very often being sort of overviews and surveys and taking averages of earlier studies and making this a new study. Um, Peter Howard and I set about, set about this some four or five years ago to do a meta-analysis following strictly the rules for a meta-analysis, that is uh, looking carefully what studies to include, uh, criteria for inclusion. Uh, one of the things that the meta-analysis literature is quite serious about is, is avoiding multiple um, citation bias and multiple sort of um, uh, author, the same author publishing the same studies updated several times. It, they could clearly get too much weight in, in a, a, a survey. So we do that and we do a number of, of other controls and we come to a, a damage function that uh, is suggests much higher. You can see here uh, in this figure, for for instance, but it's easier to look at the end of the diagram here. For six degrees of damage, we have about forty percent loss of, of GDP, whereas uh, Dice has somewhere around ten percent. So. Um, it's not surprising, perhaps, that this damage function uh, is 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 quite crucial, and um, 
this is also illustrated here. This diagram is actually a diagram that uh, Bill Nordhaus did himself. Um, he used basically our uh, alternative damage function. He, he called it the alternative damage function. You see. Um, and this is actually taken from his Nobel lecture. Um, you can see, uh, looking at the curves from the top, the base case is the sort of the business as usual. We do nothing. Uh, we get to six degrees and by 2150. Then the next curve is his optimal. The, um, this is the one with the triangle that gets to four degrees by 2150. If you use our damage function, you get to about two and a half degrees by 20, 2150, although you actually, it peaks at three degrees in, in 2100. So this is, um, this is the analysis that, that Bill himself has done. And um, of all the critiques, critical points that, that we um, uh, have sort of level against uh, Bill in this case, uh, this is the one that he's shown the greatest interest in and sort of acceptance of. That was just the first out of uh, out of several points. The next point is the uh, carbon cycle and energy balance, and this is really two points, and they're very technical. There are multiple nonlinearities, and um, so you basically you have to have a um, a linearization, a simplification. Dice is a simple model that has uh, doesn't have the full complexity of, of, of a real climate model. It just has a simple linear approximation. Basically, what what Bill has done is choose the linearization that fits the the three and a half four degrees. That is his conclusion. This linearization is quite inappropriate if you look at two degrees. Because the conclusion of uh, Bill's conclusion is that it's impossible to get to one and a half or, or two degrees. But uh, the linearization he chooses of the carbon uh, cycle is basically um, uh, exaggerates the amount of, of carbon that is, is left. So uh, if you have a pulse, uh, this is from a, a natural science article here. Uh, if you have pulses of different magnitude, different amounts of carbon would reside in the atmosphere after, uh, say, a thousand years. If you have an enormous pulse, very much will stay. If you have smaller pulses, less stays. And so uh, you can see here the, the assumptions that the DICE model makes. And uh, basically, the green line uh, shows assumptions that would be more appropriate if, if we're looking at a two degree target. And so it's actually easier to reach the two degree target than the DICE 2016 model thinks. And so um, that's good news. Uh, in the same direction, the temperature response, and this is, this is also, it's, it's severely nonlinear. Um, and it's too complicated to, <laughs> to describe with the, with the short time I have. But basically, the, the DICE model assumes uh, that there will be um, a, a, a carbon response, a temperature response that is, is too fast. Um, so um, some of both those two things makes it easier to reach one and a half degrees or two degrees than than what basically uh, guys 2016 makes bill nordhaus believe the fourth change that we do is concerns the role of the non-co2 radiative forces this is for instance the most important of these is methane that edf has worked so much on but there's also N2O and there's HCFCs and there's, there's a couple of others. Uh, these are enter exogenously in the DICE model and at quite a high level. Now, we have made the assumption that if we're trying to get to one and a half or two degrees, we're doing a lot 
to reduce carbon emissions, it would be logical that we also do a lot to reduce methane emissions and the others. So we have um, exogenously a lower um, radiative forcing from these non-carbon forces in the DICE model. Now we get to, to something that should be qualified as, as a modeling choice rather than, a, you know, there's no right and wrong about this counting, but um, everybody who's worked with a little bit, played with this counting knows that the effect of choosing one and a half or two or three uh, percent discount rate is enormous. So it's very important, it is perhaps the most uh, numerically it's most important parameter, um, but there is no right or wrong. Most economists agree to use the Ramsey rule, which says that the rate of discount should be equal to the pure rate of discount, which is just our impatience, delta. And usually people agree that this should be a very small number, plus the price of eta and g, where g is the growth rate of the economy, and ETA is uh, the curvature of the utility function. This is the simplest version of the Ramsey uh, rule. There are many other interesting extensions. For instance, introducing risk, precaution, prudence, uh, project risk and, and economic risk and the correlation between these risks, declining growth rates, uncertain growth rates, um, multiple discount rates and, and other things. What we do in this paper is quite simple. We just do a survey of experts. So this is a survey of some couple of hundred uh, experts. It's a published paper. Some of the authors of, of our paper wrote an earlier paper. So that's the paper we're referring to. And we take the average of 200 experts instead of just picking a number ourselves. And Nordhaus has delta 1.5% uh, and ETA uh, 1.45. And the median of all the experts we could find had a delta of 0.5% and an ETA of 1. So that makes an enormous difference. Um, and we will use black triangles for Nordhaus, and we will use blue lines and rectangles for this median view. So um, here we have uh, sort of the um, the final uh, run uh, when we when we have uh, introduced all our changes, um, and you see that um, there's quite a, a big disparity on the one hand between the black line, which is um, Nordhaus discounting parameters, and the blue one, which is the, um, the medium uh, values of, of the expert. There's also a green line, which is another way of taking a median. Uh, and it's the median run. We basically do a, a run, a sort of um, Monte Carlo, uh, for all the thousands of combinations of, of the delta and eta that we found in the paper, and then we take the median of that. But we could disregard the green line for the for simplicity now. Um, this will be just about the, yeah, this is the final slide, and um, summarizes uh, it's tricky because we're trying to summarize it, it, several things at the same time. Um, so look at the big uh, figure here. Uh, B, the first sort of column there, is, is the baseline dice. Then we gradually introduce uh, changes to the climate, uh, the carbon cycle and the energy balance model. CC and EVM, plus the damage function, D, plus the non-carbon forces, and the other two things that don't make an enormous difference there. 
Within each of these columns, you can see uh, that there are there is a, a black triangle, a green line and a blue line, a blue uh, rectangle. Um, the black triangle is for Nordhaus discount parameters, and the blue uh, is the discount parameters that that uh, reflect the median of all the experts that, that I talked about. So you can basically start at the top and look at the, uh, the um, black triangle, which is at 3.5 degrees centigrade. This is the temperature change in the year 2100 with Nordhaus's um, discounting parameters. And then you can look at the effect of the discounting by jumping to the blue square. And you can also look at the effect of introducing all the other changes. So if you go all the way down to the blue square in the last of the columns, which says feasibility there, um, we then have one and a half degrees, which is, which is the, um, so we, you could say that we, we um, make it possible for you here to pick and choose and, and see what all these model changes uh, do and how, in fact, with what we think are perfectly reasonable uh, changes to, to, the, to the physics uh, and, and, um, and the ethics of, of, of the parameters we put into DICE, we can get one and a half degrees with the same model instead of three and a half. So, Thank you very much. Um, I do have a couple of extra, if we, if we can keep this on, I have a couple of extra slides that answer one or two other uh, questions that might come up. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it there for the moment. Thank you very much John, for a very, very clear presentation um, and really exciting and different way of looking at some of Nordhaus's results and, and your new ones. And so I'd like to pass over to Nat Cohane, uh, Nat Cohane, Senior Vice President uh, at the Environmental Defence Fund and he leads the EDF Climate Program. So Nat, we'll start by asking some questions for Thomas. Great. <clears throat> well, thanks. Thanks so much, Susie. And uh, thanks as well. Um, Thomas, can you can you see me? I'm not showing up on my yes, screen. Yes, I right? can. Okay, nice super. to see you, Nat. Nice to see you, Thomas. And I will just add as a personal note of pleasure, it's um, as another former chief economist here, uh, but one who is far surpassed by my successors, both Thomas and Susie, as well as Frank Connery. Uh, 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 it's it's a real pleasure to be to be part of this to be part of this august group. Um, and Thomas, thank you for this paper and the presentation. I'm mainly going to ask you a couple of questions, but I thought in the spirit of, I'm not really a discussant, but I'll almost quickly be one because there's so much to absorb. I just thought I would highlight a couple of points that I want to make sure folks listening in on Zoom are, are sure to understand. I think they were clearly made in your presentation. They're very clear in the paper, but just to underscore them. First, I think there's a really nice resolution. The paper that Thomas mentions in this and the, and the presentation there's, it, it does a very nice job of resolving the sort of puzzle that Thomas started with. You know, all good economics papers start with a puzzle. And the puzzle Thomas started with is, well, how do you have on the same day these two things that seem very different? This, uh, the scientific community calling for really aggressive targets and, you know, the sort of paragon of uh, economics here, uh, receiving a Nobel Prize and, and seeming to call for something very different. And I think it's clear in the presentation, it's made explicit in the paper, that what Thomas and his co-authors have done is just show very nicely and crisply how you can resolve that puzzle when you think about what kind of underlying parameters are in the model and very reasonable choices, as Thomas said, um, help resolve that, uh, that immediately, that sort of, uh, in, in fact, you can go all the way down from four to almost all the way to 1.5 if you want, but I think the paper does also a very nice job of showing exactly what contributes to that, uh, to, to closing that gap, which allows then each of us to sort of monkey around in our own minds and think about what we agree with and disagree with. But I think that's a very nice, so that's a top line conclusion that there is no puzzle after all, once you really think through 
carefully the parameter choices. The second point I just want to underscore, um, and because I, I want to dig into the damage function and the and the social discount rate, of course, which are the, the key ones, but I just want to underscore how much um, of a difference uh, I think Thomas and his co-authors show how much of a difference it makes just to sort of update the DICE model on the carbon cycle um, and associated things, as well as on the non-CO2 and nets uh, as well. I, I think, you know, the, we've known for a long time, those of us who follow this literature, that um, damage function is going to be critical, and that's a critical, uh, that's, a, that's a critical modeling choice uh, or, or information in it. And then, and the choice of discount rate is going to be critical. Tom, much of Thomas's early work has shown that as well. But to see some of these other pieces resolved, um, for me personally, that this issue of the carbon cycle has always nagged at me. I didn't know enough to answer it, but I knew that something was off in how DICE was reflecting things relative to other models. And this paper does a really beautiful job of showing just exactly how much that matters. And so you get a quite a big difference, um, as Thomas said, you know, you get half a degree just by correcting the carbon cycle. Um, and you know, if you if you looked at some at that last slide Thomas showed, if you add in non CO two forcers and um, and nets, I, I know that's out of sequence, but that also makes a big difference. So you get a lot of mileage just from even before you get into the the nitty grit or the the the, the big issues of damages and SDR. Um, and then the final thing, just to underscore, you know, I, Thomas didn't spend a lot of time on the social cost of carbon. Uh, but for many economists and for others, your uh, other wonks, that's a good indicator alongside maybe the most important one is temperature, but uh, but social cost of carbon is an important one. I just want to pull out a finding that I thought was really interesting, which is that even uh, without getting into the social discount rate pieces that, you know, that even hold it. So the corresponding to the black triangles here um, in terms of Nordhaus's parameters, uh, once you take into account the damage functions and other things, you get a social cost of carbon in 2020 of $82 a ton. Um, for reference, the current, if you updated the Obama, the most recent Obama administration, uh, social U.S. government social cost of carbon, you updated it to today's dollars, you get 51 or $52. Um, so that's a big increase. And I think it's in line with everything we're seeing in the literature, but it's a, it's a good way. It's always a reminder to us that we need to recalibrate how we think, what we think the price should be. I know Susie is going to get into this. So really terrific paper, really interesting uh, to see. So Thomas, a couple of questions for you. One, um, the first one is just on, on the damage function. Um, I wanted to push a little bit on that because it does make such a big difference as, as you, as the paper is very clear to set, to show. In fact, if I'm keeping track, um, I think, and it maybe depends on the sequence, but the damage makes a, a bigger difference than any other sequential step you take. Just adjusting that damage function is uh, 0.8 degrees Celsius in 2100. Um, and, and yet, as you showed on your slide, it's quite a big jump from the Nordhaus damage function to the one that you and, um, and Peter did that you use here. So can you say a little bit more about the sensitivity? Have you looked at the range between those, or are you willing to sort of fall on your sword over the damage function you choose? Because of course, so much is unknown there and uncertainty is at the heart of that. Maybe say a little bit more about the, the, the role of the damage function and, and some of the uncertainty around that and how that would affect these results. Thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah, I, I won't fall over my sword though for the, for, the, for the damage function because the damage function is, is inherently enormously difficult to know. Um, we're going to find this out in 30, 40 years, uh, but damage um, is, is probably going to surprise us. You know, we, we, we get new invasive um, species, uh, maybe of disease, as we have uh, in, in my part of the world, uh, got an enormous uh, number of, of new tick-related diseases, for instance, but then it would be also the spread of malaria and other things. In the same way, there are, there are many fine tunings in nature that are related to biodiversity loss, uh, the timing, uh, many birds uh, migrate, and, and so the, the timing of when they migrate is, is related to the flowering of, you know, of, of plants, and, and, and when the, the trees or plants start to flower earlier, 
<laughs> fly the birds arrive at the wrong time. And these things are immensely complicated. I mean, I just mentioned, uh, you know, a, a couple at random there, but, uh, but you know, pests on rice, uh, a, all, all kinds of things that have immense importance for humans uh, are, can be quite sensitive in ways that we don't yet know. Uh, so what we can do and what I, uh, what, what I promise we have done is uh, the most careful review of the literature possible. But, but uh, um, you know, we can't be any better than, than the rest of the, and I think there are new studies that have not yet been written uh, that will discover new uh, damage in new ways. Um, uh, but, uh, and I should, I should, like in many areas, this, uh, my contribution to this paper is I'm the, the kind of the nice guy who knows everybody. And then there's a, a whole bunch of different teams all working very hard on, on, and when it comes to the damage function, all the hard work has really been done by Peter Howard. Who I know he's actually listening to this. Uh, I don't know if he can speak, <laughs> but he's listening to this webinar. Uh, he has spent years of careful work thinking about how to in, you know, so we do a very careful and, and honest meta analysis uh, of, of, of the earlier studies. But then, you know, some, and one of the, one of the many questions, you know, there's, there's all kinds of heteroscedasticity, for instance, but one of, one of the things that a, you might wonder about a study is it more reliable if it's newer? And well, typically, you should say yes in this case. I think that you know, newer studies are better. But this implies details of, of, of how you do a meta-analysis. And there are many other details. Um, I don't know if we can let Peter answer any of the really technical uh, questions there. But we have done, uh, and we have another sign of perhaps that is interesting is that this is I've been talking discounting to Nordhaus for 20 odd years, and he doesn't hasn't moved an inch. <laughs> he doesn't he doesn't believe in in my view of discounting. Um, when it comes to damage function, he's kind of yes, well, you know, you know, maybe you've got something there. He's been very interested. He's asked us multiple questions, and we've you know we've sent papers backwards and forwards comparing how we do the damage function, and he. And he ended up using a version of our damage function. And it, so he, this is something he's, um, and that's also a sign of the, you know, the quality of, of this revision, I think, this particular. Thank, thanks, Thomas. That's very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, let me follow up quickly with, with one question um, on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the, the discount rate. And I think there's something in the chat, but I may have to check the chat. Well, I can't do that as well. I'm also asking a question. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me ask just about the dis follow up on the discount rate a minute. I realize this you are real and ex an expert here, and and we could have a whole session on the discount rate alone. But I'm I'm the big question I always come to you know is this uh, to pull way back is the question I think if if Bill were on if Bill Nordhaus were on he he might raise this as well, uh, not wanting to speak for him of course, but between how we think about a normative uh, approach to discounting, which, which of course he has baked into DICE uh, in order to make it uh, kind of, uh, you know, mutually consistent or internally consistent. And that's the Ramsey equation that you've talked about and you, you have in the paper and a sort of positive notion of discounting, um, meaning not positive in, as in uh, being for it, but positive in terms of descriptive. Can you speak to that quickly and, and where uh, the values that you find from the median, um, uh, solicitation. Where, do, where does that, how do you think about that mapping into some of that positive versus normative debate? So the, 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 the normative is basically is sort of saying that, that this is essentially an, an ethical question. It's um, we are now in a position to make choices that will affect uh, the future. Um, and so you, you you can, and this is something that we teachers of economics do, you can uh, set up a, an intertemporal, uh, sort of a maximized welfare over the next thousand years, and you can take the derivatives of this, and you can actually derive this formula in a very simple and consistent manner. Um, 
And that's sort of the normative approach, and is then to discuss what is, what should Delta be, what should, you know, Eta and G be, and, and, and so on. The positive, I mean, the, the, the positive approach uh, is often to say, well, at the end of the day, this should somehow be related to the discount rate that we observe in, you know, like in uh, uh, treasury bills in the United States or something. And um, we, we had a, a, a great panel of, of experts some six or seven years uh, ago, Maureen Cropper put together for, for, for the, um, some work by, uh, with the EPA, I think, and Ken Arrow was on it, Bill Nordhaus was on it, uh, and I had the honor of, of being there as well. And um, actually the Europeans uh, on this, Jeff Heal and, uh, and Partha Gupta and a few, they were sort of in favor more of the, of the normative and several of the Americans seemed to be more, uh, like, uh, the end of, okay, it's fun to talk about the, uh, you know, the normative. At the end of the day, it's got to be the same as the, like the real rate of. Now, the funny thing is, the real rate of interest is nowadays zero since <laughs> a couple of years back. So I don't know really what they say about that because the last time we had the discussion was really before that happened. Um, but it's a hard one. Uh, I find it. I mean, with the discounting. Uh, that is implicit in, in what Nordhaus does. Um, anything that happens after the year 2100 has absolutely no importance at all. And uh, I just find that hard to accept. Um, so it is an ethical um, question, but it's also an ethical question that we can struggle with intellectually because we can we can we can play with the normative analysis and then we can discuss and um one of my favorite uh, positions uh, and, and roots of thinking here is is really um So, for instance, um, just like the bacteria on a, on a you know, in, in a, they will grow exponentially, then after a while they start growing. And same with, with bird population. Or other things. So, uh, dematerialized, we can, we can always have more or funny computer games and more that kind of thing ever. Um, therefore, I built a model with a one slide. Um, but if you have a model Thomas, with two we... sectors, Thomas, we're, we're really... Uh, one which I wrote is... Yes? Can you maybe turn off your screen and your video and we might get better audio? I'm sorry, we're, we're losing... Hello? You. What? Can't you hear me? Thomas, we're having a little bit of trouble. Yeah, we're having a little bit of trouble hearing you, I think. Just toward the end. So can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you again now. Okay. I'm conscious, Very good. I'm conscious um, that we have a few questions in the Q&A that have 15 minutes left. So right. okay. can, it would be nice uh, to move on to I'll this. say that um, basically material growth will, will not go on forever if you have a more complicated discount factor that takes into account um, different discount rates for different sectors uh, then this is this is also an approach a, a way of motivating why we should have 
lower this number, something I've written about in the past that is not included in this paper. Um, but just to say that there's there's a you know, although the paper is complicated, there's there's still a lot of other arguments that also might put in the same direction uh, of of um, you know that we have uh, we have to uh, apply uh, uh, a low discount rate for, for these reasons. So sorry, I got a bit thrown off by the one of the computer issues there. Why don't we go next to, to some of your questions, Susie, maybe. So we have a few questions on the Q&A here. Um, so if you could just answer these very briefly, that would be great. So right. um, one question is a technical one from Michael Roberts, suggesting that because of uncertainty in the discount rate, um, it, he suggested it might be better to use the mean of the Monte Carlo simulations instead of the median. Do you want to say anything about that? Uh, well, um, so we have had a very technical discussion about this. Um, uh, and in our model, um, we have the, the green line is sort of an answer to this. It is, it is and, and um, you could interpret, we think you can interpret uh, the green line as a sort of a voting outcome, uh, and and it is closer to um, that mean maybe. Yeah. Okay. Do you have some thoughts? This is a question from Carl Hauska. Do you have some thoughts on negative emissions, which do have a small impact in your model? Do you have? Uh, so they're actually. Um, I didn't talk about them, but there's a lot to be said. Uh, we we make the assumption that negative emission technologies are available earlier in history, in the future, than what Nordhaus does. And uh, this plays some role, but uh, not such an enormous role because we have, a, we have other mechanisms that are kicking in basically, but it still plays a role. Right, thank you. Um, we also have a comment from Steve Kohler um, whether you have any insights into which components of the damage function are more important in your specification relative to Nordhausen's, and if this has implications for climate adaptation policy making? It's basically, I mean, it's, there's some difference in which studies we include, and there's some differences in the weighting we give to different studies. There's also um, the, the way we treat catastrophic damage. Some, some studies, damage studies, have a sort of a, a, a regular damage, and then they have a risk of, of a catastrophic damage. And, or, or, as a separate issue, some um, studies have a higher nonlinearity, which in a way is sort of addressing the same question. And the way you treat these is, is, is quite crucial, but it's, it's complicated to go into the detail. Okay, well, thank you. I'd love to use the last 10 minutes to get your um, insights into what some of this means for policy, because um, it's obviously wonderful to resolve the academic differences between these optimal targets, but, but we're not heading anywhere near towards 1.5 degrees yet. And, Although the new Chinese commitment to net zero is a very positive step in that direction and, and hopefully can really shift the global um, conversation effort. Um, so, I mean, as we all know, the fundamental reason why these don't match is the global cooperation problem, the problem of free riding, um, as well as just general difficulties in getting policy um, to, to deal with long term issues. Um, I'd love to get your insight into sort of one aspect of this. Um, your results imply high emission prices should be being applied now. And that could be literally through an emissions price, through an emissions trading system or a, a carbon tax, or it could be the implicit prices that are imposed um, through certain regulations. Um, and, but you point out that we're not seeing those in a lot of places. We do now have 22% of global emissions that are covered by taxes or ETSs, which is reassuring that the prices are way lower than even the $85 that you talk about in most cases. So I'm wondering if 
you think that this is likely to be able to change fast, particularly in the current situation where, for example, Nigeria has just taken off its fossil fuel subsidies, uh, not for climate reasons, I, I don't suppose. Um, and I know that's an issue that you've been heavily involved with in the past. Is this something where carbon pricing is going to be more attractive to governments because of the fiscal difficulties they're finding themselves in or because of the uh, reduced power of that, the oil sector in that space or fossil fuel sector more generally? Um, so that's sort of one question. And the other question is in this current instance, the, the terrible problems we're all struggling with now, one of the other major issues that I see in my mind is that rich countries would optimally really help poor countries with that transition as part of getting the transition to, to happen at a, a pace that efficiently we want it to. Do you think that uh, richer countries are going to be more or less willing to provide some of that real support uh, now in a, in a COVID world? Mm. Thanks. Uh, difficult questions, but uh... It, the whole area is difficult. So first of all, I, I, I think, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a very important step that, that some countries are getting rid of the subsidies. Uh, another sign in the same direction is that India recently raised its taxes on, on um, uh, at least um, fossil fuels uh, quite heavily. They did this probably more for budgetary reasons than for, uh, than for climate reasons, but it still uh, uh, definitely you know, goes in the right time. This is an ideal time for all the importing countries in the world, to uh, fossil importing countries, to raise taxes. Uh, it will be less noticed because the oil prices are low, so it will lead to less resistance. It will help solve budgetary problems that these countries are, are facing partly because of COVID. I mean, um, the OECD countries in Europe and, and the US are, are, are doing a lot of fiscal stimulus at the moment. India, Bangladesh and other countries would like to do fiscal stimulus too, but they have no money. And that's the reason why they're raising the gas tax. Um, and, and, but of course it will have climate effects. And he, it would be a fantastic and important uh, step if, if the world had uh, just the, um, the price that Nordhaus suggests, just $50 uh, you know, per, per ton everywhere that would, would, would have a dramatic. Uh, um, but the question of, of how to get there, that you, the, your other question, um, is, is of course one that I think uh, dogs us all, uh, some of us have been discussing this issue for 30, 40 years, and we see very little progress. Sometimes I wonder, is, is, there, is there any path to, 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 um, to solving this problem? And I've come to the conclusion, I, I really believe uh, that the climate club idea is, is quite important there. Although I'm a, a great, friend and fan of, of the United Nations process. It is, of course, slow. And um, given the size of the US and China, I don't think there's any way around. I also have quite a specific view of what the climate club must consist of. It has to consist of the US and China. Um, China, I think, is showing that it is, it is ready now. It, it, I thought the news from China that they would be climate neutral by 2060 is a really large climate piece of climate news. This is really very, very important. If the election goes reasonably well in the United States, there would be a fantastic opportunity if the US and China to count for you know, a fantastic share of the emissions, if they agree, the EU will join, not that it matters that much, but the EU will join enthusiastically. It's very important, I think, to, to take time to, to make sure that India, for instance, another quarter of the world's population uh, uh, representing poverty much more than what China does, that they are included 
But that club, US, China, India, and the EU, can, can make the decision. And I think when, if they do agree, and if they agree on something sensible, the world will follow. And if some countries don't want to, they will be, have to follow. <laughs> so that's the, basically the, uh, the impl simple implication of a climate club of that size. Thank you. So one other question, um, which is kind of almost two questions, I guess. There are two sorts of emissions um, that are not really the centre in DICE. That's the non-CO2 emissions that you mentioned, but also the forest and land emissions. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how those are treated? And then I'd be particularly interested to know what you think this means in terms of methane mitigation, which, as you know, is a big focus of EDF. Yeah. Well, and rightly so. I think that the EDF should be uh, lauded on, on many fronts, but in particular for, for this, it's, it's really good to start talking about uh, methane. Uh, and um, of course, it's, it's uh, tricky. It's a communication problem. I've always wondered, uh, you know, when is the right time to start talking about methane? For instance, methane emissions implicit in food. Um, if, if people, but if people are not prepared to listen and understand that you, we can't all have big cars and drive around on fossil gasoline, then uh, you wonder if they're ready uh, for us to tell them that they should be eating less red meat <laughs> because uh, it's um but uh anyway it, i mean uh now we things are so urgent we just have to take out both messages at the same time i think and, and it is important and it's intellectually important to connect these and to work out uh, our paper doesn't do that, but I, I think it should be done to work out the social cost of methane. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I should have said that the paper has uh, all these conclusions that I showed, the diagram, the final diagram I had with temperature, that diagram is also, uh, can be calibrated in emissions in, in, um, in social cost of carbon and so forth. And, uh, and those are all in the paper as well. And, and logically, the social cost of methane uh, should be worked out, although there are uh, a couple of methodological problems that make it a little hard to pin down, as we know. So any final comment on the nature-based carbon solutions? So the, the way that land use is included there, and that's related to the agricultural methane. Of course, there's also um, methane related to gas and oil and gas production and distribution, etc. Um, but what about? Well, uh, I think one one uh, yeah, sequestration. One approach that may be important there is, is actually to to in some sense open up the discussion to include a couple of the other mega problems we face: the biodiversity crisis, for instance, the mass the sixth max extinction and the work of the IPBES and all this, um, because, because that is so intimately related to the, to the rapid destruction of forests that we are seeing today. Um, and uh, yeah, that's also a, a topic I, I work on, uh, as, as many others do. Um, the trouble one always, uh, I, I, I always feel a debate and a, and a doubt in my mind that, you know, how complicated we're going to make this message and how depressing and how many problems <laughs> we're going to bring in at the same time. Um, before we, you know, there's the, on the one hand, the risk of putting off the readers. On the other hand, um, uh, we do have these problems. They are all becoming more and more urgent by the day as we fail to solve them. So. Uh, in the end, we're forced to to address them, and and there is some intellectual advantage to to tackling and seeing that that you know that as we abandon fossil fuels, and as we stop deforestation, we will be gaining ancillary benefits in so many other respects. We will be getting cleaner urban air, we will be maintaining uh, more biodiversity. This acts as um uh, as a um, of insurance 
against against some of the other damages that climate change is, is creating. So there are many reinforcing uh, messages that we can. So that's a very know. positive place in which to stop. I'm very conscious of time. We're at one. Thank you so much, Thomas, for a really interesting talk. And um, we will continue the conversation. And thank you all for joining. Take care. Yes. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. I saw several friends in the in the list there. So thanks for joining.